Welcome all. Um, my name is Juri Landman, and um, I was asked uh, to do a lecture here today uh, with the UDK involved, so some students here, and, um, and some, I think some former mentees from the educational program from Amplify. Um, so we're here at Akut Magnoi, and uh, I'm here for one month uh, to build a collection for the, for the institute. And I have two uh, mentees that I also teach the, the fundamental skills how to make instruments really fast and uh, with simple tools and with cheap materials. And I, I think that's my field of expertise. So it's, um, it's not about the best instrument in the world because that takes you five years. This is about making an instrument in four hours and, and still have a very good uh, result. But, uh, I, I think you will understand it after the lecture. Um, what I'm going to do today is, is I'm just um, telling my, my life, life story, timeline. Um, so, and I start at the age of 10. Um, because that's uh, the first time I had uh, an experience, around that time I had the first time an experience with sound that uh, would have a deep impact on my life. Um, I, ha I had, basically every year I had fever dreams uh, during the flu. Um, and um, I posted about this uh, one month ago on Facebook and there was some smart guys who said something uh, extra and uh, um, that uh, gave me a new insight as well. Um, I, I found uh, on Wikipedia English there is this uh, near-death experience uh, article and um, uh, it describes at a certain moment uh, some kind of professor. He, he divides the, the, the near-death experiences in, in five chapters. And uh, the, the first chapter is that the dimensions become blurry, and then there's the out-of-body experience, and, and, and the third one is called the void, which is a black, black space. And then uh, the fourth one, I don't know, the fifth one is the green tunnel with the light. And, um, and I had those first three stages, basically, in those, in those fever dreams. And uh, there was, uh, like I said, one month ago on, Wiki, uh, on Facebook, there was a guy, uh, when I described it, he's like, yeah, that's the Alice in, Chain, uh, Alice in Wonderland syndrome. Apparently, that's also a name for it. And Alice in Wonderland is, uh, as you probably know, the story of, about a girl becoming, like, super big. Um, I'm not sure if she also gets super small, but uh, Gulliver's Travels is also a bit like that. Um, and... Um, it's very likely that the, the, the writer had that same phenomenon because there's about 5% of the population have this problem, I have not, this hallucinations during fever dreams or, or other, and mostly in the youth period. Um, and, and what basically happens is that you, your dimension as it is in reality becomes kind of uh, blurry and it, it starts with, with the walls that come up, up to you. You often see that in, in scary movies as well. Um, and then you, you grow or you, or you shrink uh, so you become as big as the house, or as big as, as, the, as the country, or the world even. And um, there is um, a Stephen Ditko image uh, from Doctor Strange, and he was a mystical super, superhero in Marvel. And Ditko had tuberculosis a few years before. And in this picture you see uh, globes, and they are connected with, with, with ropes, basically like the molecule structures at the, at the chemistry classes. And, and, and you can walk on those ropes. And I had that same experience, so that, that, that image that resembles pretty much what I also had. And this, what I'm now describing is all visual hallucinations, but in, this, uh, in these dreams I ha also had like an uh, audio uh, hallucination. And um, they call this pulsatile tinnitus, if I'm correct, with the English word. But, uh, and the pulsatile is basically the heartbeat, so you poof, poof, poof. And um, this heartbeat is, is a low frequency, of course, it's a pulse, but it's, it's, uh, it's filled with overtones, and, and with, uh, so it's a spectrum of sound. It's not like one, one, pulse, uh, one, one sound, but it's a, it's a full range of sound. And um, when I was, uh, like I said, I first experienced it around 10, and my, I was listening to, uh, to hard rock as a, as a young kid, like ACDC and Black Sabbath and Deep Purple. And that's supposed to be scary music, but actually I think it's like the, a bit like fantasy. It's, uh, it's a bit childish in a way. And then my brother came home with this album Pornography of the Cure. And um, this was for me mind-blowing because it was uh, so scary and it was actually exactly the sounds that I heard in the fever dreams. And um, I'm, I'm now going to show you one little sample. 
um, and specifically pay attention to the sound of the guitar um, because what happens is that the guitar has a melody line and uh, in this in, this, in the sound of this guitar, you, you hear, on, on certain notes, you hear like high, high, high frequency peaks. And they don't follow the, um, the melody line, they just pop up and then and they go down or up. So they're quite random compared to the melody line. And, and that's basically a bit similar to what, um, what happens in the, in the tinnitus as well. So here we go. I'm not sure, we didn't test it, so I hope it works. Yeah, can you put it louder? Yeah. Perhaps a bit more. So there's this kind of bell-like sound in, in, the, in, the, in the sound of the guitar, which is kind of strange because it's not, not linear with the, with the melody line. Now, this is uh, 19, I think it's 1982 they made this album. This is the third album. This was in the period that they were on heroin and uh, they were in a dark mood. So the, the, the album is pretty, pretty much like this all the time. I think it's a, it's a pure uh, beauty. Um, so at first I hated it because I was I was afraid of it, and then it becomes it became my uh, I would say my top ten album. It's it's ever ever been there always. Um, then I jump to 1991. That's the year um, of Nirvana. It smells like Teen Spirit, and. Um, uh, Nirvana gave interviews and I was like really flabbergasted at how aggressive and how new that music was at the time. I was 18, so it was also the, the right moment for me to, uh, to experience uh, artistic rock, as you could say. Um, and they, they uh, Kurt talked a lot about Sonic Youth and, and, and of course uh, multiple other bands, but he was prominently promoting Sonic Youth all the time. Um, and so I started checking uh, Sonic Youth, and I already had the Pop Encyclopedia, yeah, the, the Dutch one, and it, I, I knew what was written in it, but I never heard the music because uh, I just never checked it. And then I started checking it, and I recognized the sound of the, of the pornography album, but way more prominent than, um, than the Cure ever achieved. And um, so this is um, another example. It's also in the, in the intro of the guitar. You immediately hear this kind of strange sounds. In, it's not like a normal electric guitar. <laughs> yes, so that's their hit single from 1992, I guess. And this is Slint, which is also uh, a band that has the same, same similar chimey guitar sound. There, there are quite, quite not so many bands that have that specific sound. Okay, yes? So this is just to give you a little bit of the impression of the, the sounds I was hunting for. And um, the great thing about, about Sonic Youth is when I bought the CDs, uh, there's on Bad Moon Rising and I think it's on Sonic Death, there's a few pictures. And um, on those pictures you see the guitars, and the guitars they have drumsticks in between. So they're completely... Uh, I don't have a drum... Oh, I have a pencil, I can do it with that one. So normally you play on the fretboard, but in their case they just... Uh, I can take this one. They just jam this in between, like that. Yeah. So the, you cannot use the fretboard anymore. And I quickly understood when I saw those images that uh, I studied the gametes and physics at the time, um, that it had some relation with, with a thing called overtone theory. That's something you get at, uh, when you study acoustics and, uh, during the physics lessons. And um, most of you probably know it when you have a jumping row and a rope and you put it uh, to a tree and you, you go up and down. But if you go twice the speed, you get this eight shape. And basically that's the first overtone. Yeah, so the, and if you, go ev if you would go even faster, then you would have three of them. So there's like a momentum in the middle which is, is stable and it just remains there silent, basically. 
And, um, and this is something you can do perfectly well with oscilloscopes and with, uh, with, with tone generators, uh, so you can get those images. But I, when I saw that stuff, I was like, oh, the way they achieved that, that specific sound with the, in the guitars is because they put sticks in between and they place the stick on a, on, a, on a silent moment in the overtone theory. So if this is the string length, which is 60 centimeters, for instance, then on 30 centimeters, you put the rod, or on 20 or 15, like a logical ratio of the whole thing, then you can get those uh, remarkable sounds. Yeah? And um, so that's what I, what I did when I, uh, at age, I, I bought a guitar in the same year. And um, basically, there's, uh, I would say there's two philosophies that I follow uh, with guitar playing. First of all, I'm interested in the, um, in the nightmare sound. I don't want to make funny music, but I want to make people really afraid. And, uh, and uh, second of all, I, I have quite a strong um, punk mentality in, in the way I think you should make music. Uh, I think sh music should come from, from intuition and from yourself and not uh, through the textbook. And I was pretty sure when I would, uh, I live in a quite a shitty town, so when I would have a teacher there, that I would le learn all the blues scales and all the jazz progressions. And that's exactly what I didn't want to do because I hate ju blues and I think I even hate jazz even more. So I, I, I refuse to take lessons. And um, uh, so the, the, and this, this, this clip clarifies pretty much my, um, my idea. This is David Fair from the noise band uh, Half Japanese. And it's a very funny uh, animation. So I hope you enjoy it. I taught myself how to play guitar. It's incredibly easy when you understand the science of it. The skinny strings play the high sounds, and the fat strings play the low sounds. If you put your finger on the string further out by the tuning end, it makes a lower sound. If you want to play fast, move your hand fast, and if you want to play slower, move your hand slower. That's all there is to it. You can learn the names of the notes or how to make chords that other people use, but that's pretty limiting. If you ignore the chords, your options are infinite, and you can master guitar playing in just one day. The thing to remember is, it's your guitar, and you can put whatever you want on it. I like to put six different size strings on it because it gives you more variety. But my brother used to put all the same thickness on so he wouldn't have so much to worry about. Whatever string he hit had to be the right one because they were all the same. I highly recommend electric guitars for a couple of reasons. First of all, they don't depend on body resonating for sound, so it doesn't matter if you paint them. As also, if you put all the knobs in your amplifier on 10, you can get a much higher reaction to effort ratio with an electric guitar than you can with an acoustic. Just a tiny tap on the strings can rattle your windows. And when you slam the strings with your amp on 10, you can strip the paint off walls. It really doesn't matter what kind you buy, as long as the tuning pegs are on the end of the neck where they belong. A few years back, somebody came out with a guitar that tunes on the other end. I've never tried one. I guess they sound all right, but they look ridiculous, and I imagine you'd feel pretty foolish holding one. That would affect your playing. The idea isn't to feel foolish. The idea is to put a pick in one hand and a guitar in the other, and with a tiny movement, Rule the world. Yes. No, oh, that gives a good impression of what punk music is, I would say. Um, so that's basically what I also did. It's like I, you just play instead of uh, learning how to play. And by playing, you learn it automatically. Um, I have to follow the order. Let's see. Yes, this is the fair. Um, I already showed you the, the third bridge, as I, as I call it, like the, the, the stick in between the strings. And um, I also work with like small uh, uh, springs from pencils and chopsticks and uh, paper and aluminum foil and everything that you basically could find in a house. You can put it in the guitar and then you can get really magical sounds with it. And um, I think in 2009, around 2009 or something, I wrote a small four-page manifesto and I put it offline because my English was not so proper, so I was not so, uh, so happy with how it uh, uh, was written. And, uh, but Bud Hopkin had uh, read it, and uh, he's, uh, he's quite a famous uh, instrument builder, and he publishes a lot, a lot of books about how to make kalimbas, how to make marimbas, uh, slap tubes, uh, how to amplify instruments. And, um, and he started working on a book about uh, string uh, preparation because it didn't exist. And then he asked me as the, as the expert, sorry, uh, to fill in the gaps of his story. So I made this book with him. 
Uh, it's available if you want. Uh, there's only three copies, but um, and it has uh, 60 sound samples, if I remember well. Yes. Yeah, so there's a, uh, online you can listen to all the sounds, and the book describes how we did it. Uh, so there's like a chapter, and then there's like a little uh, microphone icon, and it has the, num the, the song title, and then the, the book uh, explains you. So you can look at it after the lecture, you can take a look at it. Um, so that's the, the preparation techniques, and, and ignoring the, 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 the traditional way to make uh, guitar music. Um, I want to give you a, a small introduction of... Uh, of the, uh, what, I, what I call the history of experimental music, uh, musical instruments. Um, musical instruments, are, of course, uh, they existed for, uh, forever, basically. Um, but they were always tools. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I think this, this changed uh, around World War I. There was a guy in Italy, uh, Rizzolo, and he's, he was one of the futurists. He was a painter, but he was also a musician. And he recognized that um, the sounds that occurred uh, due to electricity and, and because of the Industrial Revolution, there were new sounds in the world all of a sudden. The plane flying over, um, the machines in the factories, the train, all those, uh, they, they had quite specific sounds. And, and, he, and he was thinking like, well, I like the violin and the piano, but they cannot uh, copy that kind of sound. So he wrote a manifesto like, I want to make noise music. Um, and to, to, um, uh, to do that, I have to build a new uh, set of instruments, and this became uh, a part of his performance as well. So this was the first time that he considered the musical instrument an art piece itself. And, and those, uh, those Italian uh, boxes are called intona rumori, which is something that's like noisemakers in Italian. And, um, those noisemakers were destroyed by bigger noise. They were destroyed in World War II in Paris by, by bombing, so they don't exist anymore. Um, but there are so there were still some some sketches, and a friend of mine in Holland he has built fantastic replicas of it. And I did House der Kultur in der Welt. I did a performance here during a festival about war a few years ago. Um, so we play one time a year or one time in three years, not very often. But uh, So we have that collection in Holland. And there's an Italian collection, but it looks not so nice, to, to say it polite. It's, it's made of cardboard. And, and there's a New York collection. So there's three collections in the world. Um, so this is a solo. This is around uh, World War I. And that's, I would say that's the first noise artist, but also the first guy who, uh, who turned musical instruments into a, an art form, you could say. Um, a, bit, a bit later was the guy Teremin, uh, the Russian, uh, it's a funny guy, he's also a spy, for, it's like a very James Bond. Um, so he was, uh, he was an instrument maker, but meanwhile he was also spying for the KGB in the West, and he was touring in the West, uh, and he gave all the information back to Russia. Um, but he was the guy who made the, 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 the rod, and when you move it with the hand, you have the, um, the good vibrations sound, basically, from Beach Boys. Um, that's an Ondas Matano, which is a bit different, but it's, it's similar, similar in sound. Um, so, Rusolo, Teremin, uh, then there was um, Faresi, where he integrated um, the, 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 the sirens in his music. And so, and a siren is not really a musical instrument, but it's an instrument to warn people. Um, it's a sound maker, and he considered it an instrument as well, so he, he took it uh, in, his, uh, in his orchestra. And then there's two guys in America, Lou Harrison and John Cage. And I would say they made, uh, John Cage is of course very known for his uh, three, four minutes of silence, whatever it is. Um, but he made many other things. Um, and one of the things that he did in the, in the early 40s, or during World War II, was um, he heard the music of Gamelan uh, from, from Bali and, uh, and those islands in Indonesia. And um, they have different sounds and different scales than the Western music, so it's for, each, for us it's very odd. And um, they wanna, Lou Harrison and, and uh, Gage worked a lot together at the time, and they started collecting all kinds of metal and they put it on foam and they were drumming on it and then this approximately sounded very Eastern for our Western eyes. Uh, ears, sorry, not eyes. Um, and then, so he had this steel percussion stuff and then Lou Harrison did quite similar stuff. The, 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 the musical pieces are quite, quite, uh, quite identical. 
And then he had this famous uh, moment where he had to make a musical score for a dance, but the room was very small. And uh, there was a grand piano in that room. And uh, he decided he could not bring in the orchestra with all that metal stuff because it was just too big and then it would, there would be no audience. But he could approximate that sound by uh, putting objects in the piano. And, and here we go again to the string preparation techniques. And, and that's what you also heard in, in, the, son, in the sounds of the, the cure and sonic youth, that this kind of bell-like sounds, they easily occur when you prepare stuff. So you can do like really big gong sounds with just one string if you know how to prepare it. And um, so he was the first who started it. And in the 70s, it was uh, copied on, on guitar. And then Glenn Branca has Sonic Youth and, and some others came. And uh, so it, it was integrated in, uh, in uh, experimental rock music. Um, that's, that, like I said, that, that's really, in a nutshell, five minutes of instrument building. There is um, this guy. You are, are you mostly German here? Not a, oh, I was hoping, but uh, because this is a this is a Flemish guy, and and Flemish is Dutch, but um, I think for yeah, perhaps for English-speaking people, it's possible to follow it. This um, it's a very obscure sound artist. There's only four lines of text on internet about him, and there is Klankobjecten, this one. I'm not going to show it because it's two chapters and it's half an hour. Um, but I'm just mentioning the name because I think he's a very interesting guy and uh, he will pop up later in when I do the instrument demonstrations as well. Just this name there, this is the part two. He was a Belgian guy and he had like huge blocks of styrofoam and he jammed in um, uh, metal objects and long strings and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a wonderful documentary to check if you are interested in this kind of stuff and hardly nobody knows this guy. So. That's just uh, a giveaway for you. There's also very, uh, I will do that later on, yeah. So George Smits is, I would say, is, uh, is interesting for you. Like I said, it's in Dutch, but uh, you will get there if you, because there's a lot of sound involved, so it's quite easy to follow. Um, I wanna go to, uh, there's also Harry Parch, which is in the timeline of the experimental instrument builders, but I will go to him later on. Uh, and I want to move on with my own uh, career. Um, there is, let's see if we can find it. Uh, Mood swinger. Yeah. Milder. Let's do this one. So. Ah, and here you can also see the Overtone series that I was talking about earlier. Um, around 2000, I owned a, a comic book store for a few years, and in, those, in, that, in that bookstore, I had to, uh, to build closets and, and displays. And uh, normally in a living room, you can buy, buy stuff in IKEA and other shitty shops, but for the, for the store, it's kind of difficult to, fi to find uh, cheap furniture. So I was kind of forced to build my own furniture, and then that's where I was uh, 28, yes, 27, and that's where I discovered that I was actually quite handy, and I had a talent to design stuff with, with building stuff. So in a few years of those, that shop, I learned how to, to become a carpenter, basically. And I had a long time desire to leave, the, to abandon the guitar, because the, the, the sticks always drop out on stage. Uh, or, 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 the, or the tunes like hell. So I'm, I was always problematic with, uh, in the studio it worked fantastic to get all those wonderful sounds. In life it was a nightmare because I could not reproduce it. And by, um, by building your own instrument I would have a certain degree of control in the chaos, basically. So it was, a, uh, and so in, in 2000 I started building my first instrument and of course the first one heavily failed and then the second one uh, but the first one sounded good already, but it was impossible to tune. So it had all kinds of, kinds of practical issues. And then the second one was a bit better, the third one, and the fourth one was good already. So that was, uh, and that was like 2001, 2002, and 2003. Every year I built one, basically. So it took me ages to make one. And then, um, and then it uh, accelerated in the production speed, and I made like 20 instruments between 2000, 2000 and 2006. And uh, this created, uh, I, I like to talk a lot about problems in my life, so this, was, this created uh, the first problem in my life. Um, because I was, uh, creatively, I was focused on building stuff. 
and uh, th which meant that I was not longer playing any music, I was not composing any music anymore, because I was constantly like, ah, I have built this one, now I want to build one with this, and then I want to build one with this. So I was completely uh, missing my call, basically, to make proper music, because I was only building, 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 and that's where the creative, uh, creative uh, mindset went into. Um, so my friends, they, they all uh, were very enthusiastic about what I was building, I was like, yeah, but do it, but you don't make music, and it's on your attic, and you can make ten more, but it doesn't... Um, uh, solve the problem, and uh, you're only making uh, yourself uh, more messy in your uh, in your house. Um, so I, I decided to uh, to take a step, and uh, I had just gotten in the um, the third album of Liars. It was illegally online, and uh, I was really struck by uh, Drums Not Dead. That's the, that's their third album, and they made a they they made a very successful first album, and then they made a, a very experimental second album, which I like a lot, but it, it was financially quite disastrous for them. And then they made uh, Drums Not Dead, and it was like their big boom. Um, but I already heard it, when it before it came out, and I was like, oh, this is exactly the band that, that reproduces that kind of dark, gloomy sounds that you also have in the early Sonic Youth and, and, and the Pornography album and the Tropic Crystal and all those bands. Um, so I mailed them, and then, like, I have a proposal to you. I want to give away an instrument uh, so you can do promotion for me with the instrument, and, uh, and, and we have like a win-win situation. It costs me a bit of money, but I'm, I'm fine to do that. And um, that's, um, that's the blue one with the stick, which is basically an, an improved guitar, you could say, in the way it is prepared. Um, and uh, it's 12 strings, so you have 12 notes. You have all the 12 notes, so basically, of one uh, octave. Um, so I built that instrument for them, and um, I, I, was, uh, I was not completely like, uh, like give away everything to everybody, but they were the opener acts for Sonic Youth at the time, and that's, I was aware of that. So I was like, well, if I, if I give it away to them, then I might have an open door to, to Sonic Youth. And uh, that happened. Basically, after I, I made this one, I, um, I mailed the uh, Sonic Youth because the email was on their website, uh, oddly enough, at the time. And uh, I got within one hour, I got the agency back that they, they had forwarded it to Leonardo, the guitarist. And then one day later, Leonardo replied. So I was a little bit in a shock when that happened because I was listening to the music for 20 years, and all of a sudden, this god replies that he wants to meet me. And um, so we met, I met him, and I met. Uh, so I, and he wanted to have a harp guitar, which is it looks very good on on, on the picture, but it, it's uh, it's a horrible to play. But it's uh, I think he, he also he, uh, he likes my other instruments better. But it looks good, so that was uh, also important. Um, now there's uh, there's a, a strange thing with uh, for the people who don't know Sonic Youth, it's, it's quite an influential band uh, among uh, other bands. Uh, so if 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 you have if you work at Sonic Youth, other bands want to work with you too. And um, basically, what happened is, is that this is called a media spiral. So I, what I did is, is I, uh, I was, I was mailing magazines. Like uh, I'm, I'm the guitar. I, I made this guitar for Sonic Youth. Do you want an interview with me? <laughs> and uh, and all the all the magazines want an interview with Sonic Youth. But then, then they did the interview with me, which was a bit like Sonic Youth. It was not Sonic Youth at all because I just gave it away to Sonic Youth, but nobody knew. And, and Lee was supporting me as well because he could laugh about this this phenomenon, and um, so I did like 200 interviews in uh, four years, and uh, and and it, it got really like in, in Liberation and Frankfurt Allgemeine and and uh, the, the Tag or Tas, what is it in Germany, the, whatever. But all those all those all the newspapers in Holland, and um, then I was on the prime time television in Holland with one million viewers, and and and, and Guardian and CNN. It was like fucking crazy, like. <laughs> Um, and uh, meanwhile, I was selling guitars like, uh, pretty pretty well. I, w I went to Primavera, and um, I, ca I call uh, because that's in Spain, and I called Spain. I just took up the phone and I started talking really fast English because I was pretty sure that the Spanish cannot speak English as fast as I can. And it's like I'm the, I'm the guitar builder for your Sonic Youth, and I want to meet. Uh, I have an appointment with Liu Barlo, and I have an appointment with Inon, and, I, and blah blah blah. And I sold like nine guitars in one weekend. Uh, on that festival, and I had like a whole fucking rainbow of, of uh, backstage passes there, so that was quite a quite a strange uh, strange happening. Um, and then basically, it, 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 this is the second problem that occurred. My guitars are very bad, so I was selling to all the heroes because because I work for Sonic Youth, but actually, so they bought all my guitars, 
but nobody ever played on the guitars because they are really you know how you have to know how to play on it and, and they only work for certain specific sounds and not really as a normal guitar so you have to be quite quite uh, you have to have the right mindset for it so um so i was cheating on all my heroes and I, that was that worked well that felt nice for a while <laughs> um but also the all the journalists meanwhile like yeah where can we hear the sound and nobody had, had put it on their albums of course because they didn't play on it and um so this i i created this uh we call it luchtkasteel in dutch uh, like an air castle is that english like uh yeah it's like an empty empty thing and um if i'm i'm I still good with the time Yeah, I have to change a bit, but okay. Ah, oh, yeah, no, this is good. Yeah, so this was uh, around 2009. It was getting really problematic, and then there was a, luckily there was a solution from a guy from Belfast, and he said like, "Well, um, can you do a lecture with us at our, at our festival? Basically, this lecture that I'm doing now." And um, uh, but uh, I also would like to have something with with building stuff. And can you uh, can, can you make a workshop for us? And uh, at first I was a bit like, that's, that's heavy, because how do you, I don't know the people, my English was so-so. Uh, in Belfast, which uh, there's a sea in between Holland and Belfast, so you have to fly, which is also complex with, with all the equipment. Uh, but I took the, the, I was in the garden, I was thinking, well, if I take that blue one as the example, and I uh, simplify it, then you basically have one big piece of wood, and you need two pieces of wood to make it stable, so the, 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 the strings don't bend the, the, the first piece of wood. And then you make a small gap so you can put the pickup in, and you have this headstock for the tuning packs. Basically, you have that one, and that one took me six months, and I tried this one out, and I, I was in two hours, it was ready. So then I knew it, it would fit for a workshop for, uh, for four hours. And, um, so this one tip from this guy from Belgium, uh, Bel Belfast, it completely changed my life because um, I was a graphic designer for a living and I was going bankrupt on, on, the, on, on all the time that I spent on the guitars and, and buying all that stuff. And um, with this, uh, I could drop my price from 1,000 euros to 125 euros. So it was, uh, it was a, a massive uh, drop in the, in the price of, of the instruments. And people don't pay 1,000 euros for that stuff. I sold like three or something of this one for, to, to normal people, not to the bands. And, um, and uh, of this one I sold 4,000. So that's a completely different uh, level. Uh, and because it's the workshop, because with, with the workshop you have 10 people working for you, 15 people working for you, we do four hours. And uh, yeah, I, I, I have good money on that if you do a little bit of calculation on 125 times 15. Um, so I could quit my job. Um, because of this one tip, and um, due to the success of this, this home swinger, um, oh, so I, sorry, th that one is, is called the mood swinger, and uh, because I had some uh, plus and minus, uh, uh, how do you say this, mood swings <laughs> in my personality, I was not doing so well at the time, and this is called the home swinger because it's the do-it-yourself version, but it has nothing to do with wife swapping, so... That, uh, that's something that I discovered later on when I put in Home Swinger on Google, then you find some interesting websites. Um, but that, that you don't think that I'm, <laughs> I'm obsessed about that. Um, but, yeah, so this was, this, was, uh, this was like, I would say this is like my number one hit in, in, in terms of uh, commercial success. And because of this uh, was good in, in uh, Northern Europe, but when you go to, uh, to Portugal, for instance, 125 euros is kind of a problem because it's too expensive. Um, so I made a three-string variant. I don't have that one here, but it's a scaled-down, simplified version of that one. And uh, there were a lot of people talking about kalimbas in that workshop. So I, I, that's just an African instrument I will show you later on. Um, so I also started doing the kalimba things, and then uh, I made the guitar variant, this one. That's also a workshop model originally. And then, our, then the educational cen uh, centers, they discovered me, the, the conservatories in the art academies. And I started doing uh, workshops on art academies. So I became this traveling teacher through Europe. And meanwhile, I was making a shitty music that nobody wants to listen to. But I'm still doing that for fun. Um, so that's a that's bit of the background of my, my art uh, job that I have currently. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. I want to show you. Uh, oh, yeah. I can do a little bit. 
of an addition, like, like I said, I, t I travel around Europe mainly on academies, uh, doing this kind of teaching workshops, like one, two days, five days sometimes. Um, now I'm in Amplify one month, which is super long for me. Normally I just go in and out. Um, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to build an instrument collection for the, um, for the institute so they have their recording space here and then, and then the people in the future can play on that stuff and then they can make new sounds uh, or discover other ways to how to play music. And I think this is collection 12 or something in Europe. So there's one in Porto, one in Zagreb, one in Ljubljana, uh, one in, uh, in Finland, two in Finland. And uh, so I'm basically dropping all my shit in the world and, and then when I travel I can just uh, access that those uh, facilities and I don't have to travel with all my own gear. That's basically the dream that I have. Um, and all, meanwhile also it, it, it's kind of making people more familiar with, uh, with, with all this stuff. Um, yeah, so that's about the collections and I, and I now want to... Uh, I have two things to... Uh, to show you uh, two topics. Let's do the, the boring one first and then we end with the, with the funny one. I think that's a better order. Um, there is, uh, when I started working on the Mood Swinger in 2006, I already mentioned that I have a background in, in science. Um, and um, uh, so I was, I was aware of this stuff uh, during my, uh, my high school years. And, and this is basically the tonality scale of this instrument. And, um, and it's derived from that one. And um, I was looking at this pattern. And you can see there's like a big space in between uh, the gray one and the blue one. But in between the blue one and the yellow one is super small. And then there's a big space again, and, and uh, medium space, and then a small, small, small. And I was wondering, like, is there some kind of a pattern in that series? Can I recognize a certain uh, fractal, basically a reoccurrence of a pattern? Um, and so I started looking on internet, and I found this uh, this movie. I think probably a few of you have seen this. This is a black plate with um, basically salt, and there's a speaker underneath, and the speaker gives a tone, and the tone uh, raises in pitch. And, and look what happens with the, with the shape. patterns become more complex when the pitch raises. I think we have had enough. Um, oh, sorry, stopping. If I, if I go back to this one, um, if you can see, this is, this is a, a, the lowest frequency is in the top, and then this is the first octave, and then there's the perfect fifth, which is the third open, second overtone. And you can see that the, the, the seventh overtone has a lot. And that's a high-pitched one. So it, that, that plate that you see is basically, I, I always say like the string is like dimension one. It's a line. It's like the x-ax. And if you have i-ax and x-ax, you have a field. So basically the black plate is a field. Yes? And uh, so the higher the frequency, the basically the, the more complex the, 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 um, the visual aspect becomes. And you could say that basically if, 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 if normally this is the overtone, and, and in the field, it's also like this. So then you have this kind of flower patterns that occur. So it's, I would say it's the second dimension of the overtone series that you see in the strings. Yes? And um, so I said second dimension. And now I want to show you a movie which basically introduces you to the third dimension. And um, this is one of my favorites. The guy who invented that um, trick with, uh, with the plate is, uh, I think, Gladney, he did it with a, with a violin bow in 1800s or something, like pretty, pretty old. 
Uh, but the tone generator guy is uh, Hans Jenny, and he's from Switzerland, and he was a mystical guy um, who had like hundreds of these kind of tests. And the next video is also from Hans Jenny. And um, he made the word uh, semantics, in case you have ever heard about this. And I will talk more about semantics in a minute. Let's first do the movie. This is a mixture of water and cornstarch. The ease with which it can be stirred and with which it drips from the stirrer indicates that it behaves very much like a liquid. In a moment, we're going to show you what happens when you take this mixture and shake it. One of the surprises will be that when you poke a hole in it, that hole will remain there. I have to explain to you what, what this, this cornstarch is a, is a, is a matter, it's, so it's a fluid, but when you shake it, it becomes solid. And uh, this, is, uh, this is the opposite of, of ketchup. Ketchup you have to shake first, and then you can uh, take it out of the bottle. The, 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 but then you know uh, what, what is happening in the movie. Now we're going to ramp up the acceleration with which this container is shaken. With some acceleration, Faraday waves set in. They fade in and out of view because the camera is out of sync with the shaking. Now we're going to shake the mixture with a fixed frequency and acceleration and apply a small puff of air. The puff of air creates an indentation. And that indentation grows to a hole and it just sits there. The hole doesn't disappear. Here's a close-up showing that the hole actually penetrates the entire layer. This is the same process except viewed from above. And what's important to point out is that this is real time. That hole is just sitting there. And even though this is a liquid light su substance, it is not closing. Yeah, so it's a movie, it's not a picture. Here are three holes surrounded by Faraday waves. The two central holes are interacting with each other. They come close and then they repel. The light is such that those bright horizontal lines indicate where the rim of the hole is. Now we're going to shake it at 25 G's. Now the original indentation from the puff of air doesn't create a hole, instead it creates this writhing mass. From the original indentation, these finger-like protrusions grow. Those fall, they create new indentations, which then give rise to new finger-like protrusions. And eventually, this structure will cover the entire surface. Yeah, so it's a swamp where the more monsters are born, basically. When I saw this, for me, it makes quite sense that, that the light, which is also a vibration, the sun, uh, does this on a, on a molecule level. And uh, yeah, why shapes occur in nature. One of the reasons, not the reason. Um, so this is, um, like I said, this is entering the, the third dimension because we're getting up. Not in, it's not a field anymore, but it's still getting up. And if you, if you go a little bit further about this, um, you could say that, that it, it rises. And uh, if it splits in, in, in the octave, and then it splits again in the second octave, then you get a broccoli flower. Yeah? So that explains the shape of, of how our broccoli is shaped. Uh, which doesn't mean that it's the third dimension of sound, of course, because a broccoli doesn't make sound. Uh, but it, it gives you a better understanding of how shapes occur in, in nature and how order is being organized. Um, and that the shape of the, of the broccoli also occurs in the atom bomb, for instance, only then the, it, it's more diluted. And, um, and if you look, uh, yeah, perhaps we can show you. Yeah, I can, I can show you. Um, So, can we get something? Yes, here we have the human. And where is one? Hmm, I don't see one. Well, but if we take this one, you could say there are better images, but I can clarify it with this one. You could see that there's trees in here. Basically, this is, this is the ground, this is, these are the roots of the plant. Yeah, so you see that that shape 
of the broccoli or the shape of the trees, they, they occur in many, uh, many instances. This, like I said, this has nothing to do with music, but it's just to uh, give you a bit of understanding on, on how fractals and, and semantics create those uh, similar looking shapes. Um, I, um, there is this, uh, I'm going to show you the most terrible book in the world. This is, uh, here it is, your favorite book, yes? And uh, just buy it and don't read it. That's my, uh, just put it in the, in the, in the closet. There's uh, 20 pictures in it, and this, that's fantastic about it. That, that, that's like the highlight, uh, the highlight of the book. And uh, the other 400 pages is about fractions and maths. So it's like super boring. The guy has zero humor. He's, uh, he's a very serious guy. Um, his name is Harry Parch, and uh, he's my big hero. Um, I already gave you Rusolo and John Cage, but I think this is really the guy. Um, there's YouTubes about him, so go to YouTube and put this like in your, in your uh, look at the pictures and go to YouTube. And I think YouTubes are way more uh, uh, fun than this book. Harry Parch is, um, is not so known uh, as, a, as a composer and as, a, as an instrument builder because he, uh, he basically what, what his background is is that he discovered that there are flaws in what we call the, the 12 tone system. Ah, shit, I, okay, I will integrate that soon. And he discovered a new system based on the overtone theory, um, and he put 43 notes in one octave. And which is a massive amount, but with, those, uh, no, with all those notes, he could uh, reach uh, a new music, basically. And for, to, to make that music, he had to make all those instruments, a bit similar to Rizzolo. So he had an, uh, had an idea, and then he started building those instruments. But those instruments are like super big, so he could not transport the, the instruments. Uh, and that's, uh, he never left the uh, United States with that stuff. It, it was only there somewhere, I think, in California. Um, and that's why he's not so known, because he, he never really uh, got big on it, because he could not perform with it, which is a bit of a sad story. And a few years ago, there's, I think, Konrad Böhmer, if I, if I say it well, it's a German guy. He made a replica for the European market. So there's, a, and it was on the Holland Festival in Holland a few years ago. Um, so there is nowadays a production in Europe that has this stuff. Um, I'm going to show you uh, something, and um, I forgot it at my apartment, but uh, I will um, give it to, uh, to the UDK students through, uh, through Brett, and uh, perhaps other people can pick it up here. I'm here on Monday if you want to have it, because uh, they are for free. Um, I made this diagram, and uh, this took me like four years of uh, figuring it out. And basically, this is the translation of the strange sounds that you hear in, in Sonic Youth and, and Cure uh, compared to the Western scale. And, um, and there's uh, a second diagram and a third diagram, which I don't have with me. Um, I can show them on the computer a little bit. But I wanna, I'm, I'm going a bit too fast because I miss one detail. Um, I was already saying that the, the spacing of the overtone series is kind of strange. Sometimes there's a big space uh, where can we show it? Do I have it here? Yeah. So there's sometimes big spaces and sometimes small spaces. And, and, and uh, this is the, the Western scale on the guitar. And, and already during my, uh, my, 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 my experimental days uh, with, uh, with the drumsticks, I was like, why doesn't it overlap? Uh, and, and that was always a big question for me. Like certain threads, they overlap very well, and certain don't match at all. So, and also I could not really figure out like why is the spacing so irregular on that one? And this is quite, quite logical, you could say, officially. And then I started thinking about this um, Turkish instrument. It's a, it's a Turkish sas. A friend of mine had this one. And uh, where's this at? Here. Yeah, it's this instrument. Builder. Ooh. No, just pick one. You can see they have they have the the strange fretting as well. Yeah? So I was when I was thinking about this, like, oh perhaps the, the Turkish people they have some kind of overlap with, with what I do. And I couldn't really figure it out because there's a lot going on there and it didn't really match. And then I found uh, this one, which is uh, ancient China. 4,000 years old, builder, 
this one. And this is, uh, when I saw this one, I, I fell off my chair because it's, it's literally a copy of, uh, of my own instrument. So uh, <laughs> I, was a bit, I was a bit late with my discovery. <laughs> it's, it's like 4,000 years earlier, and a guy was in China already that smart that, oh, well, let's do it like that. And it has exactly the same, same code as, as on my instrument. And that's the Overton series. And this is the favorite instrument of uh, Confucius as well. And, um, and it's part of the Voyager 2. Uh, that's the collection for human uh, intelligence, I would say. Uh, so, Hikin, or whatever you pronounce it. Uh, they don't have the rod, so it works a bit different. And this is specifically a strange story because um, I come from noise rock, like a super loud, aggressive, dis uh, dissonant music. And when I listen to Chinese music, it's like the most serene, most calm, romantic music. And it makes uh, meditation all, basically. And I was like, how is that possible? Because I make chaos, and this is like super order. Yeah? And then I, uh, I was thinking about uh, Escher and, and, and the Möbius, uh, Möbius ring of Escher, the, the famous drawing. Uh, Escher perhaps pops up like this. Yeah, perfect, with the, with the ants. Beautiful. This one. Yeah? And um, so I know this image for a very long time because I'm, I'm a big fan of Möbius, the comic book artist, and he's named after, uh, after this effect. This is, uh, I think it's Austrian or German, I'm not sure about Möbius. But Möbius was a smart guy and he had a friend who had a mill and the, the, the belt in the mill was uh, slighted, what is slight in English? It, taking, it was cut, it was, uh, had suffered on one side, but when you inferred the, the clip on your belt, you can get that shape in real time. So it's not, it's not a fake image, the, the image exists. And, and now the, the belt could twice as long work on the mill. That's the background of the Mobius strip. And to connect this image with, with the order chaos, I was like, okay, but it's not chaos and order, it's, it's, they, they touch each other, so it's like a ring. And there's this, in every chaos, there's a certain degree of order. And then basically you enter the field of what is called chaos theory. Um, and um, and I got uh, I, I got really lost for years in that topic because uh, it was so 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 big and so complex to understand, and um, I, I constantly saw new images and I could refer to the to the harmonic series. I already did that with the videos with the with the cornstarch and with the, with the plate. And um, I was sitting in a train from from Bordeaux to Toulouse, and then you have all those wine yards, um, and they have all these sticks in a grid basically like the military cemeteries. And I could see when I was sitting in the line, there was always this big gap somewhere there. And then I looked, and then there was a second lane there, but the second lane was smaller, and there was, there was similar to the, the lane there. And I was like, wow, that, that's the octave, and that's the perfect fifth, and that's the 90th fret. So I could connect that, that image of, the, um, of the, the, the grid of the military cemeteries to the harmonic series. That's one of, one of the examples that I experienced. And, so, and basically, uh, this, this research, I'm doing it for 20 years, and I, every time I open a room, and then I see another door, and I open a room, and then this continues forever. But uh, I hope one day that uh, I will find a room with no, no doors anymore. Um, I want to show you the diagrams, because uh, then you can f uh, think of if you want it or not. But uh, like I said, they are for free to pick up, but I will have them here on Monday, or later on. Uh, it's this stuff. They are also online, by the way. If you go to my website, uh, this is the one that I show you here. I just showed you. And uh, let's go back. And uh, this one. Is, this is the other, this is two, this is the other two. And this is quite funny, I, I was uh, doing uh, a funding application and uh, I had something, oh, I want to explain them. So I explained them what I, what I was planning to do, I was planning to do this, and I'm not really in the mood to explain it all. But then I was like, oh, the, the funding application doesn't understand, perhaps I should do it a little bit bigger. So I was working on this one, and this one, sorry, for, for four months. 
And then I was like, well, uh, nobody understands this diagram because when they get it, it's so complex. There's so much going on there. And so this was the starting point and it became this. And then, uh, worst of all, I was doing it for four months and after four months, like, oh shit, this is the eternality of Harry Parch. So I had, I had read the, the boring book four years ago and I was working for four months on the, on, on the diagram and I didn't realize that I was basically uh, ending up with the same stuff that he wrote in the book. And um, so it's again, like I, I'm, I'm good at discovering stuff that already exists. That, uh, I'm very professional on that. And, uh, but worst of all, that this is the eutonality. And as soon as I found the eutonality, I knew, oh shit, there's also the otonality. Because it's like, like uh, plus and minus. So again, four months. And uh, that was that one. And, and, and uh, luckily, the otonality was a bit smaller. So it was a bit easier to... to uh, Compose in a diagram, so I had some space left on the paper, and uh, and I knew about the um, the Pascal triangle, and the Pascal triangle is like one, 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 one plus one is two, one plus two is three, and then three plus three is six. And that's called a uh, Pascal triangle, and I knew it was connected to the harmonics triangle, as I call it. So I I made the harmonics triangle, then I did the color coding of the first diagram, which you don't see. Then I did the color coding of the second diagram and the color coding of the third diagram. So all, all three pyramids are having the same fractions, the same system, but just different color coding from different diagrams. And then I discovered that this, this brown one and the, and the green one, they are mirrors. They're, and um, uh, to give you a very simplified explanation of what it is, this is minor, and this is major. Yeah. And this, I would say this is natural minor, natural major, because now minor and major, uh, minor and major are Western uh, definitions of what it is. And um, this proves that, that minor, and uh, minor and major are existing in nature, because it's plain mass what I'm doing here. I'm not doing any, any uh, Western musical theory here. And um, uh, yeah, so that's that. And then I was... Uh, wondering about like uh, okay, eternality, eternality, and he uh, Parch is very known for what he calls a tonality diamond. That's the, this, this rhombus shape, and uh, I was like, well, why is it in the in the is it hidden in the pyramids? And then I discovered, well, okay, uh, the, if I simplify it to one, it's there. If I take two, it's, uh, two times two is four. Then it's there, and then the three times three is there, and the four times four is there, and so it sinks in basically uh, when the things become more complex. And this is the Harry Parch. Uh, diamond, and he also has this one in the book, but this is the one he always used in the musical instruments, and that's that's somewhere here. Yeah, so that 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 uh, explains how what a genius that guy was that he could develop that system. Um, so that's uh, the diagram stuff. Like I said, if you want it, uh, give me a sign, and uh, we can. Uh, I'm here still two weeks in Berlin, so we are, we will have time to meet and hand it over. Enough uh, about that boring stuff. Uh, for the ones who are interested in uh, microtonality and uh, Reinistimung, just intonation, uh, that, that, this is basically the fundament of that stuff. It, it gives the distinction between uh, equal temperament and, uh, and pure notes. So uh, the, this is the pure system, and uh, this is the, the wrong system, yeah? which I, I play the wrong system because I like it, because it's, it's pretty simple. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I always uh, explain, like, uh, like uh, I, I don't really believe in microtonality. That's a bit of a, a strange thing when you make those diagrams. Um, I think microtonal composers are very concerned about the perfect pitch. And the, way, the reason I'm doing that stuff is because I'm an instrument builder and I just obviously hear where it's good and where it's not good because you can literally, I will show you in a minute. Um, so for me, this is very relevant as a builder and, and also to explain musicologists when they ask uh, difficult questions, I have the di diagrams to back me up. And, um, <laughs> and, so, so, and some microtonal experts looked at it and it's correct so far. So I, I have not discovered any, any flaws in it. Um, besides that, it's unreadable. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I uh, go to the Western scale, and I was already describing that the, the intervals are different on, on the Western scale uh, compared to the, to, the, to the harmonic series. 
and you could say that this is this is pure nature yes this is how nature works and, and um, so this is that's what the Chinese why so why the Chinese music sounds so elegant because they, they stick to that those values and then and then there's this uh, this this whiny guy from Greece and he's very good with maths and the, the guy is called Pythagoras and um, he had this famous triangle but he also had um, the scale of Pythagoras yes so he I was thinking about like oh, okay this is this sounds nice but I cannot I, I basically I want to jump from from one to one third, and from one third, I want to again one third of one third, basically, and then you end up with four nine or and twenty seven and eighty one, all those those uh, complex fractions. And so his series is composed out of uh, multiple steps uh, from one to one third. Of I'm talking about string lengths, yes, and then he transposes one octave back. It's, it's kind of a technical thing. And with this system, he could develop twelve notes. And uh, the 12 notes are nearly good. Uh, not really good, but they, they, are, they function pretty well. A few of them, they, they sound really nice, and a few of them sound pretty awful. And uh, worst of all, the 12, they don't close. So there's, it's like a, like a clock, and it's three minutes before 12, basically. So it's not completely, and this is called the Pythagorean comma. And um, then there's this, this guy from, uh, where's Bach from? From Germany, right? Yeah, I'm always confused with it. Bach and Mozart, okay, Germany. And Bach had a friend, Werkmeister, and Werkmeister was also a very mathematical guy, and this was the guy that already accepted the roots, the root functions. And in the Greek, they, don't, they didn't like the roots, they just pure fractions. And um, Werkmeister started calculating with the root functions, and he came up with this, um, uh, what is the skill called? Werkmeister skill, I don't know. I think it's, yeah. But uh, Bach made the Das Volta and Temperierte Klavier musical piece to prove that, the, that he could work with that scale. And that scale was quite beautiful because he could move from every note to another note. Like he could transpose the music. He could, uh, and, uh, and this is in the, in the Pythagorean uh, function not so easy, but in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this Werkmeister system it worked well. And that's why the, fa the art piece uh, is so famous because the, he was the first guy who had access to a new system that he could just move around all those notes. And then, of course, you get the mean tone temperament and all those temperaments. But basically what happened is that um, from Bach to 1900, you could say, they constantly changed the, the fret positions a little bit on the piano, and not on the, on the instrument, but on the, on the, by the tunings, basically. And, uh, and because they changed it a bit, they could make a, a very strange move from E, C to G, or from D to F sharp, or whatever. And, and uh, every, tu every tuning has that stuff. And that's also why it's often called like fuga in demol, because the, the demol has a certain flavor in that specific tuning. So, and then they call it as dark, or light, or funny, or depressive. And so they, they, um, they hang emotions on that, uh, on that key. And that's because of those temperament. And then in 1900, it was such a mess, because the, uh, and, and there was also the influence of the colonial uh, uh, cultures. So you can see that in the, in the Van Gogh pa paintings, there's like these Japanese kind of, uh, how do you say this? Uh, compositions in the, in the, the, the plants that are, are on the borders of the, the famous Van Gogh paintings. And there was a guy, Claude Debussy, Claude Debussy, he also heard those uh, instruments from 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 the east, and he wanted to have that on the, on his on his instruments, and he he started working on a whole tone scale and other scales, and basically the only thing they could do is just stretch the whole fucking thing out, that you would have 12 equally spaced frets. So every fret has a, 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 a little bit smaller, 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 and that that creates this grid basically, um, and this is called. Uh, how oh, is this called? 12 TET. Um, equal temperament. Yeah? Gelijk zwevende stemming in Dutch. Um, so when I, when I compare this to nature, you could say, like, okay, the Chinese, they had a tomato. And then there was, uh, there was Pythagoras, and he put it in a pan, and he stirred it for like three minutes, and he had a perfect tomato sauce. And then you have these guys from America, they drop in uh, the tomatoes, and then they drop in one kilo of sugar, and they stir it for seven hours, and it's called ketchup. Yeah? And ketchup doesn't have so much to do with the tomato anymore. And you could say, like, this is Chinese music, which is proper music, this is classical music, and this is pop music. So pop music is basically like ketchup. It's, it's like, really bad. Yeah? <laughs> no. 
and, uh, and, and of course, noise music bends back to China. So noise music is like this. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, that's healthy for the brain. Yeah? <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's enough, uh, enough jokes about uh, good music, bad music. I want to end with you about this table. And uh, I have this table full with instruments, and I'm going to show you them quickly, one by one. And I drop them on the floor so you can see them, and then I go to the next one. Let's first start with this stuff. This is the collection of guitars and uh, the home swinger, of course. Um, this is my model. This is the, the most simple way to make a guitar. Like one back plate, and you buy a shitty neck for like 30 euros, 40, and you put it on, and, and then you go to the OB or Bauhaus, and you buy the steel rod, and you, yeah, and I, I always separate my pickups so that it's like, so you can do. Uh, I can plug it in. I cannot really play guitar, as you know. So this is going to be a funny moment. But at least I can let you. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's distortion on it. But you can do this. Uh, so that, that kind of that kind of tricks. Um, And here you have that. That's the sound of the Cure and Sonic Youth, because they have this on the Jaguars. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the same system as this. Yeah. So this is the White Eagle because I think it looks a bit like an eagle somehow, especially with. Yeah, I don't know. And then uh, one of the guys made uh, that one because he. It's a it's a very dark guy. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 he made a beautiful, uh, more rocky, it's, it's essentially the same instrument as this one, it has a little bit more, an extra pickup, and there's a piezo in it, but a very beautiful piece, and I just showed, showed him like how simple it is, and now you can look at it, it's still wet, right? Yeah, so be careful with touching it, just look at it, and this is one that Philip is making, so it's not ready yet, but again, copy of this one. And uh, this one has shown. Okay. I have this blue one here. Um, often people ask me, like, how, how do I do that with the blue? That's really simple. We call it ecoline in Dutch. And it's like ink. That's like really that stuff that you put on paper from the artistry shop. And then you buy acrylic paint. And, uh, and acrylic paint is also water-based, and it sucks up the, the blue ink from the that you have put on the wood. That sucks it in the lacquer, and it becomes like this really. Uh, so it's a very handy trick to, to make a fancy-looking instrument. It's it's actually uh, it's, it's completely similar to this one, only this one has a little bit of furnish. Um, so this is a six-string variety of this one, and it's as you can see, it's smaller, so it fits in my suitcase, which is important for me. Um, so I will show you this one. Where is the cable? Ah, this is it still in the kit, aren't it? Let's see where it goes. Ah, there. Okay. Now, I will now expose you why I'm so concerned about overtones and uh, overtone theory. Is there somebody with a guitar pick? It's in my... Uh, it's in my... You have... Ah, okay, great. <laughs> yes, I never give it back, so... You oh, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... I want you to... Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I have this rod and I'm moving the rod to the middle. Yes, and I want you just to listen, and then you will recognize that there's something happening. This one.
Yeah? So you could hear this. Yeah, that's good music, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can hear this moments that are, that are increasing in sound volume. Yes? And uh, sometimes, uh, it depends a bit on the equalization, but sometimes you really hear the overtones a little bit better. I didn't really, I was not so happy what I just heard, but perhaps on... Here. So you have these bright moments, and they, they, so they increase the volume, but they also have that specific overtone popping out. So that's why I'm so concerned about the diagrams, because there's an optimum in the instrument that sounds good, and other precisions, they sound not so good. Um, so uh, it's purely about uh, instrument building. Um, yeah, fun, funny thing about this one is that you can do this kind of stuff. Uh, so now it's in the middle. So you have this, you can basically play one side and release it, and then the, because of the resonance you have this Yeah, and that's something which is not possible on a guitar, so that's really nice that you build something and then you develop a new technique because of the, the instrument that uh, gives you access to new, new things. Um, so, this one is off, we already talked too much about this one. Strings. Um, that's the only string instrument that I have here. There's a, a great instrument that I always play in live shows, if I can, and I will do that on the 28th when I do the gig here. Um, and this is in my garden. And uh, it's a long string instrument. It's like, uh, in this case, uh, 10 meters long. And I will install it uh, in the backyard when we, when we play here. And this is purely the instrument, it's not, a, it's not an effect pedal. So the, the delay is the instrument. And that's the distortion pedal. get an idea. My, peop my, my neighbors are really fond of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a, that's a long string instrument. I will play that on two weeks, uh, two weeks from now here in the show. And um, I will now uh, move to the rest of this table. Um, as I said, this is a string instrument that is one of the last, uh, I would say, uh, string big string instruments that I developed. Uh, after 10 years of building, I've pretty much I don't have so much any ideas anymore what to do else with, with the strings, because, uh, yeah, I, I built it. And then, uh, oh shit, this wasn't, this is a wrong one, it's an unfinished one. Well, okay, I will just do it without amplification. Um, in the workshops they started talking about the kalimbas, and uh, this is uh, actually quite a new model, because I can pull the rods and I can put them in a certain scale, and that's always a problem with, uh, with the kalimbas, they are in one scale, and then they never match with your song that you're playing. I'll make them shorter for you, then you can hear it. This is an uh, African instrument, and uh, 
it's very elegant, especially with, uh, with delay and reverb. And I put it on, on guitar pickups because then you have a very deep tone. And now you cannot hear it. Yes, it has this, this kind of raindroppy sound. No, we took the wrong one. Oh, okay, shit, I didn't see that. Yeah, we have two holes, yes. Okay, uh, again, where is my... So, we have it. Yes, yeah, so, and then, of course, you can go... I'll just do something random now, but... And uh, normal kalimbas uh, are acoustic from Africa and they exist in an electric format most of the time with a piezo pickup. And I don't like that because they have this really sharp sound and this stuff you can only get with a, with a proper guitar pickup. So the, uh, that's the reason why I choose for the guitar pickup. And uh, this is a, a spring, spring steel. Uh, Federnstahl, I think is the German word. Federnstahl? Federnstahl, yeah. And they sell it at, what was it? Got the name of it. Modular? Modular. Modular. Modular has that stuff. And it's really cheap, like 60 cent or something like that. You can also do it with a rake, you know, from where the leaves, in the autumn, the leaves drop down, and you can buy a rake. Um, but it's a hassle to work, so don't do it, because it's really beautiful, and it's good for the fingers. But actually, this is, uh, I prefer this because it's, it, it's much uh, easier to build, and I just put nail polish on the tips, and uh, so uh, then it's also friendly for the, for the fingers. Um, kalimba. And then I discovered, because you buy that, that uh, spring steel on one meter, and uh, that I actually, that's quite nice, because I can make it really long for you, and you can hear it. And where's, yeah, here. It uh, sounds like a church bell. Yes? And that's because you can see it if you, if you, if I play it, Perhaps you can, I'm not sure if you can see it from there. You can see that the movement is like one hertz, basically, or, or half a hertz or two hertz, like something that we cannot hear. But the only thing you can hear are the, are the, are the overtones. So the, um, and, and in a, in a kalimba the, for, the, for the nerds, uh, there's only the inharmonic overtones, the uneven harmonics, so the one, three, five, seven, nine. And then the string is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and, and when you have that uneven series and the uh, one is missing, like three, five, seven, etc., um, that approximates the sound of a church bell because they also have that kind of composition in their uh, in their multiphonic, as it's called. Yeah. Okay. So I had this. Ah, uh, oh shit! I don't have the steel bars for the foam. Do you know where that is? That's in the studio. Can you get that? Because then I can explain the cocktail party effect. It's a bit, it's getting a bit longer. Is it okay with you still? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I like those long sounds, so I started to... Uh, I made this instrument, which, so it's a variant of the other one. And, uh, oh, I don't have my stick here. Is there a drumstick in here? Ah, oh, fuck. Yes. Great. So you can do... Uh, Yeah, and then I can change. And then you can do... You can do this, this magical stuff. That's again, that's something you discover after you've built it. So I didn't make it for that purpose. So, uh, which brings me to the third one. I can put this one here. And that one, yellow. And now we go to the, this one. So again, a kalimba. And uh, so it's... So it has the same phenomenon. But uh, in this case, I made uh, aluminium, uh, like uh, uh, metal. And uh, I didn't fix the thing because I like this kind of... That's really uh, like Looney Tunes. 
Yeah, so you can do this kind of re. So this is my solo instrument nowadays. When I do my guitar solo, I do it on this one. So, um, a bit of a, oh no, no, not this one. I can do that one later on. Where did, ah, fantastic, great. Um, yeah, I think like six instruments to go. Um, this. I was already showing you the, the George Smiths guy from the Klank Objection on, on YouTube, the obscure Belgian sound artist. And uh, this triggered me to uh, make a variant of his, uh, his wonderful creations. So he had these huge styrofoam blocks with metal in, in, in jammed in it. And uh, metal sounds fantastic in the air. And since styrofoam is only 3% mass, you have this that kind of sound, you can jam it in the styrofoam and it has that capacity. And um, then I started working with styrofoam beds and with pickups because I want to amplify it and I want to loop it. So I, when I play, I want to have it loud. And um, then I discovered that this foam also works instead of styrofoam and it doesn't break so easy. So this is easier. So I put this stuff and I just collect random pieces of steel. So there's no logical order in it. And uh, let's do another one, this one, and uh, plug it in. Here. And this one is, yeah, it works. And then, uh, oh. Yes, um, and which I like a lot because this is not like the silly glockenspiel like do re mi, it's something random. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of um, uh, understanding about it because there's something strange going on here. Um, for me, it's always like... Oh shit, sorry. For me, it's very musical. And I was surprised, like, how can it be that it's always, uh, because this always happens, if I... It's again good. Uh, and how is it possible that it's ne never out of tune, in a way? And then I, so I thought about this a while, and then I thought about, like, the cocktail party effect. And the cocktail party effect is, is uh, something everybody knows. When you are on a cocktail party, that's where the name comes from. And I'm doing a, 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 I'm talking something, and the, my neighbor is also talking something, but to somebody else. Your brain can filter him out if you want to listen to me, or vice versa. So um, what your ears actually get is something different than what you actually hear. Yeah, which is kind of kind of strange. So your brain is pretty smart in, in, in filtering stuff. And um, what happens here is why it always sounds good is because this one I cannot hum it. I don't I don't know what I cannot do. I don't know what it is because it's a multiphonic. It, there's a cluster of sounds. But when I do ding gong gang, then all of a sudden it becomes the hum or whatever I, I, you, you, you think about it. So in combination with the other ones, apparently your brain search for the logical sounds. Again, like a, a proof that the music is in nature, it's in, and it's in our brain, and it's not really something that we invented, but it's a discovery that we, we made as human mankind. And people think it's culturally um, an invention of human mankind, but actually it exists. And I would say that's uh, one of the proofs, again, of that. Um, so this, this, this steel, uh, the steel rods. And then uh, I'm still working on the steel. Uh, what also works great are the circular saw blades, the, the, the discs. They, they sound fantastic. And you can hang them in the air, but you can also put them on the foam. And they, they go on forever. And I have these, I like these square plates because they fit better on the thing. And, oh, Yes, very simple, very gamelan again, very Indonesian. So, um, so I often use that as the percussion in my set. 
and then uh, I will put this away. So I want to make the table empty. What's the pickup in this case? This is a five-string jazz bass, uh, purely for for the for the uh, the the, sh the size of it. It's just longer, but it can also work with uh, for Akuta I'm making one with normal pickups. But this one uh, is just a little bit ex more expensive and, and fancy. And they fit really nice. Yeah. The books I have, well, everything out. Uh, this one away. Ah, this is something I want to show you. Um, when you play on this kind of stuff, it's, uh, um, it can be, uh, you don't want to have an 80 euro bow on it, from uh, it's like a cello bow. And this is a cold rack hanger, and this is a tip I got from a guy uh, from Estonia, Eric. Uh, and he showed me, and, he, and, and I improved it a little bit with this little forky on the thing. But basically you take fishing wire, and you put it on, and then you, you wax it, like uh, on a normal violin bow, and you have uh, a violin bow for one euro or two euros. So it's very, uh, you need the old-fashioned wood. And you, there's, also, there's two types, there's also one with two pieces of wood glued, they have like this bulb here, but you need this one, so with a hook. Yeah? So a very easy way to, if you look at it a little bit, then you know how to make a simple bow. Um, this is another one in the family of the, I don't have to amplify this one because. And these are discs to uh, flatten the floor with. If it's concrete, you know, and then it becomes a flat floor. And these are old ones, of course, and this is cat, uh, cat milk for the drinking for the, for the cat. And then, has this nice sound. And now some, I can amplify this. Yeah, this one. If you, you only hear the clang, but if I put it in the... So it's really... It's very deep. That's also one of the reasons I am so fond of guitar pickups, because they really have the low kick. And... Um, well, this one we can put away. Ah, I have here, I have a secret. <laughs> this one? Yeah, this is not my, I only did the decoration of this one. I didn't make it. Um, I have a, a little bit of a dark friend in Holland. And um, a funny guy, he's like 19 years old, he's very young, and he wanted to have, uh, he makes uh, distortion pedals. But he also, he, he wanted to kick the babies. That was his dream. So he wanted to have this one and he would kick it on it. And that was the stage performance. And uh, so I saw it, I was like, oh, fantastic, what a concept. And there's a heart. So, funny one, I would say. Not everybody likes it, but <laughs> whatever. And this one, so I have like one, two, three, four. Yeah, we're nearly there. This one, I was uh, listening to. Uh, the third album of Porter's Head, and there's this fantastic track with some kind of a helicopter sound in it. And it's like, oh wow, that, that's so good. And I, I didn't, he made it with a synthesizer, but I couldn't really figure out how do you make, compose a sound like that. It's quite a complex sound. That vuk, 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 vuk. And I was like, well, perhaps I can do it with a pickup. So I made a, a little magnet in the tip and, and, and a pickup, and, and, and with a motor, I could spin it, and then uh, I would have the helicopter. And um, this is, uh, so, and this completely failed, because it didn't happen, but something else happened. Oh yeah, of course, there's no cable in this. This one. So. So, yeah? So it became this techno beat, instead of, uh, instead of the helicopter, which is also nice, because then I could kick out my drummer in my band, and that would save me a lot of money. So, and, um, so this became my band, and then uh, a bit slower. Yeah, and then I have this pedal. And, uh, so I can do this stuff. Yeah. 
and this is a pitch shifter delay. So it basically every sound that comes after is do 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 do. And if you do that, do that very fast, you have good techno music. Do 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 do. Yes. And so this is the on my automatic one. And uh, the helicopter. It's helicopter. <laughs> yeah? Do you agree or? <laughs> Whoa! What is that? Ah, I hear spring reverb, and in the, in the, you can also do the spring reverb very nice from the amp. You can buy it for 25 euros separately. I didn't bring it, but uh, I also use that one. And then uh, this is uh, similar. Yeah? So, new order. And uh, Blue Monday. And basically, again, there's a magnet in it, and I just, uh, it's about the speed, it's not about the pressure, it's purely the, the speed of it, and it creates a perfect sign pulse, and then it's a silent sign pulse. <laughs> Very big, big sound, especially when you have a good PA system. So, uh, that's my drum kit, and then I have two, two things to go, I will close with the phone, and this one. I don't see my, ah, oh, shit. Is it in here? No. Yes, so we have something here. Normally I use the clips from hair, from girl hair, like, uh, but uh, this works too. That one. And then uh, contact mic. I hardly work with contact mic, but sometimes you have to. I, I'm not really keen on them. They're super cheap, uh, but they also sound pretty shitty. But there are exceptions. And some people can make uh, good preamps with it, and then it sounds good, but I'm not capable of that. Uh, hmm. Why don't I hear it? Oh, it's output, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm mixing up the cables now. Uh, yeah. And this one should be in, in here. So, sorry, yes, so, yeah, <laughs> so I have like a series of bottles in every country and then I, I, I buy them in the supermarket and I have my own African drum, oh yeah, and you can do Especially with the small bottles, it's easier to flip them. Uh, and this was a, a, like a really lucky accident. I was just in the fridge and I opened my fridge and I, I just discovered, like, oh wow, this really sounds nice because that's the sound basically of the bottle. And every bottle has their, this is quite high, but if you have, they are sturdy in Germany, they are different in Holland. Um, holy shit. Uh, when you take, uh, it took me a while to understand it, well, why, what is going on here. And then I figured out like, it's the gas of the, the Coca-Cola. And when you take the lid off, the, the pitch drops. Um, and so the, the gas basically puts the plastic under tension. So it becomes like a drum. And that's also why it sounds like a drum, because it's essentially a drum kit. Yeah. So you can literally pitch it with, uh, and I also discovered that the gas disappears. So if you have like a one year old bottle, it sounds shit. It also tastes quite shit after one year. <laughs> but, uh, so the last one, I'm really happy that uh, this is uh, 2019, summer. Uh, I was, uh, I, I made music for eight years, always without sound, uh, without voice, because I'm not very convinced about my uh, capacities as a singer. And I always felt a bit uh, awkward with, uh, with a normal mic. And um, then I was, uh, I was searching for this, this uh, Sure Bullet. This is some kind of a specific carbon mic. And uh, I discovered, oh, fuck hell, that's uh, it's like 130 euros or something. I got a lot of money for a shit mic, because it's essentially a very, very shitty old mic. And then I was like, oh, I have a telephone on, on my attic. And it basically has the same quality sound, 
because I was hunting for that sound, this kind of sound. And so I, I hacked the telephone and I put it on Facebook because I had three telephones. It's like, well, I, I, don't, I only need one. So, uh, and then I had 70 people who wanted it and I was like, oh shit, how, how do I do that? And then I started buying from eBay and uh, the local one in, in Holland. Uh, about 300 telephones now. Uh, and I'm constantly making those telephones. And, um, and this hacking really went far further because you have the old dial telephones with the, with the number system. And you can, if you, do, if you hack it, you can, uh, it's a relay basically. So they can, can chop the, the voice sound with it. And uh, I also have the number, dee, 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 that stuff. You can make it, you turn it into a synth. And this is quite, quite interesting because it's, a ma it's nine number, ten numbers. And every row has the same sound. So there's like four rows, four sounds, but um, hor this is horizontally and vertically, they also have the same sound. So it's a, it's a duo sound, it's not one sound. And uh, so that distincts one from two, because they, have a, one, uh, they, they come from different rows, but in this they are the same. So yeah, it's kind of an audio illusion because you play like eh, 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 and it's all the same. And then you go uh, horizontal and all, all of a sudden it's different. Yeah, well, interesting stuff to listen to if you, if you press the numbers. Um, I only brought uh, the phone because I have one suitcase. Uh, and uh, so it is, it is like this. And uh, all of a sudden you sound like you're going to do. I can mute it. Sorry for being loud. Yeah. And uh, so that's the phone. Uh, and this is the twin tone from Holland, and I'm really fond of this model because it's indestructible. And, yeah. and they come in red, which looks good. So that was my uh, my lecture. Yeah. Good. <laughs>